Simpson. Uh, sometimes thought I was a local expert on politics. I'm not sure about that part. On behalf of the Iowa History Center uh, and the John Culver Public Policy Center, I'd like to welcome everyone to this special program on the Iowa caucuses. Before I get to the introductions, I will have business to take care of. Please turn off your cell phones or turn them to vibrate so that they don't interrupt the proceedings. Also, following the program uh, in the foyer out there, the lobby out there, there will be um, a reception. Also, drop off your evaluation forms. And those of you who have forms from me, I'm right here. <laughs> After the program, see me and I'll collect them. Tonight we have three political analysts who will offer observations uh, about the caucuses in the 2012 presidential race. As I said, after their presentations, we'll have some time for questions. And following that, uh, the reception I mentioned in book signing in the lobby. Now for our speakers. The procedure we're going to use is I'm going to give you the introductions, and then they're going to come up in turn and speak for a bit, and then we'll do questions. Our first speaker will be Kathy Obradovich. Kathy's been covering Iowa politics for more than two decades. She joined the Des Moines Register as political editor in 2003, and in 2009 she took over from David Yepsen as the Register's political columnist. She makes frequent appearances on national media programs and has also developed a following for campaign coverage on Twitter. Our second speaker is Dennis Goldford, a professor of politics who has been on the great university faculty since 1985. Dennis is a well-known political analyst for local, regional, and national media, including KCCI, TV, and the more. He is the author of several books, and following the program, he'll be signing copies of a new edition of the Iowa Precinct Caucuses, The Making of a Media Event, a book he co-authored with Hugh Weinberg, also a critic. Our final speaker will be John Skipper, a political reporter and columnist the Mason City Globe Gazette. <coughs> His new newspaper career spans 40 years, and he has covered presidential campaigns going back to Gerald Ford. The following program, he will also be signing copies of his book, The Iowa Caucus's First Test of Presidential Aspiration. So please now join me in welcoming Kathy O'Brien. I think that remains to be seen. 
But you know, look at look at Mitt Romney, for example. He's got very good reasons not to spend a lot of time in Iowa. Um, he doesn't want to be seen as the prohibitive front runner here, uh, because then a win in the Iowa caucuses is essentially meaningless, and a, and a loss is a massive disaster. So uh, he's got a lot of sort of risk. Um, management that he's doing here in Iowa and not spending a lot of time in the state. I think that will change as we get closer. In fact, he's coming back to Iowa on Monday. Um, so I think that we'll see more of him in the last um, nine weeks than perhaps we saw of him in the first nine months of the caucus campaign. Um, Herman Cain, uh, he spent a lot of time in Iowa late last year and early this year. Um, he is talking the Iowa poll um, by one percentage point in the front of and he has really not spent very much time in the state um, since August. So uh, I would say that his support is being driven a lot by his position in the national polls, which is being driven a lot by his performance in debates. Um, it's, not, um, it's not perhaps uh, the most solid type of foundation that we have for uh, moving forward in the Iowa caucuses, but it's, it's what he's got right now. Um, you know, I think that one other reason why um, Republican caucus goers are perhaps unsettled or not so sure is that here in Iowa, we're still, um, even even now, still in this age of social media, et cetera, still a very grassroots uh, uh, campaign state. And a lot of the real active caucus goers that I talk to are not willing to make up their mind, first of all, until they've, they've actually seen candidates in person. Uh, but the really top activists, the prime, you know, the, the cherries out there, the ones that you, know, you really want in your basket, uh, they are, they're, they want to be asked in person. You know, they expect to be courted face to face. And I, I talk to people who are, you know, they're on the list of 50 most important caucus goers in Iowa, you know, influential people um, in Iowa. They haven't been called. So the campaigns are going about this in a maybe a little bit unusual way. Um, one other reason I think is that there's a sense that President Obama is a lot more vulnerable than any president, really, I think, since Jimmy Carter. And Republicans are perhaps being a little bit more fussy about who they choose. It's not just a question of electability this time, although certainly beating uh, Barack Obama is their number one goal. Uh, but they feel like they can be a little bit more choosy and, and just the, the candidates check off quite a few more of those ideological boxes uh, that candidates want uh, or that, that caucus goers might want. Uh, they want the candidates to match up a little bit more exactly with their own positions on issues, for example. And furthermore, they're holding them to a higher standard of actually having accomplished some of the things that they have talked about or at least not having their records contradict um, what they are talking about. And you know, that's a problem. There's a problem with every single one of the presidential candidates from that standpoint of either having sort of a disconnect between their ideological positions and their records, or um, the sense that they're being able to, being able to give as a, as a professional <coughs> eligibility. Um, so so the, the caucus scores are being a little bit more choosy this time. And, and also they are, um, you know, I think that they're also still kind of waiting to see, um, you know, it, the, the field also gelled very late, so they've been waiting for a long time to see if anybody else was going to come out of the woodwork. And so that has sort of taken a long time as well. So, um, you know, I have no sense of how long I've been talking, and I think I'm just going to stop there. I, I, I think we can take a spin through all the candidates in the field, and we'll do that before the end of the time. Uh, but I think I'm just going to let these guys take a crack at it first. And, oh, before I relinquish the microphone, I have to give one, uh, one little commercial. Uh, the Des Moines Register now has an Iowa caucus app for the cell phone, for the iPhone. <laughs> and it is free. It is free. But if you have an iPhone, uh, go to the iPhone's app store, search for caucuses, or search for Gannett. Um, it's very cool. Um, you'll get all the Iowa caucuses from the Des Moines Register, plus uh, a calendar that says where all the candidates are going to be in the state. And you can also look at videos and other cool stuff. So be sure and do that on the iPhone.
professor for 15 minutes just to clear his throat. <laughs> so I'll keep an eye on this. Um, Iowa, and I'm grateful, very grateful to be here tonight. I appreciate your attendance. Um, Iowa is not first because Iowa is important. Iowa is important because Iowa is first. In any serial nomination process, whatever state or whatever entity goes first, just by being first has an extraordinarily large impact. The reason it works this way is because <coughs> of the sense of something that didn't happen with the adoption of our Constitution. The Constitution, as you know, replaced the Articles of Confederation, gave us a much stronger national government, <coughs> though from neo-Confederates and some Tea Party circles you hear something different nowadays than the, the Constitution change the basic structure of the Union to a more nationally focused form of government while allowing for states to continue to exercise a significant number of powers. At the same time, our political parties are still organized in a very confederal way. That is, just as corporations don't go to Washington to charter themselves as corporations, they all end up going to Delaware because Delaware has made a big business out of chartering corporations. Political parties are chartered and organized and principally regulated at the state level. This is why it's so hard, for example, for third parties to have a chance in American national elections. Because where the, where the Democratic and Republican candidates always have automatic ballot positions in all of the states, if you want to start a third party, you've got to collect signatures for a petition, get enough <coughs> signatures, have them validated as legitimate, and get them approved on a state-by-state -state basis. So you really got to start from scratch if you're doing a third party. The system is structured the way it favors the two major parties. <coughs> so you have to understand our parties is operating principally at a state level. And the national parties in Washington are really more like trade associations rather than top-down, hierarchically organized kinds of political parties. That's why when it comes to the caucuses, we tend to have this game of leapfrog every four years. Other states don't like the fact that Iowa is first, <coughs> partly because uh, they want more of an impact on the nomination process, and also because they think that in some way Iowa distorts the process, because they believe Iowa is not very representative of the rest of the country. Now, how did Iowa get to be first? And John can talk very much in detail, because he's covered this from almost the beginning. But it's pure serendipity. It's purely accidental. In a sense, I say quite often to my students, it's all Jimmy Carter's fault. He happened to notice, or some of his people happened to notice in 1975, when he was still governor of Georgia, that in 1972, Democrats got together for caucuses. And remember, a caucus is a party conducting business, principally doing two things, electing delegates to county-wide or county-level conventions that occur about a month after the caucus. So we go from what's now 1,784 precinct caucuses down to 99 county conventions, which will then go to four district conventions, congressional district conventions, and then to one <coughs> state convention in June for each party next year. But Carter's people noticed that some of the McGovern folks in 1972 managed to do something uh, that nobody had noticed before. And it was simply this, a Democratic caucus, and some people had the bright idea of saying, by the way, one of you're here, whom do you prefer to be the party's nominee this time around? And lo and behold, Senator McGovern popped up, who hadn't really popped up very much. The lead candidate was expected to be Edmund Muskie, who ran as Hubert Humphrey's unsuccessful vice presidential candidate in 1968. Well, when Carter left office, he came and camped out here in Iowa for about 14 months. And lo and behold, under the radar, there was no media coverage other than the Iowa reporters, if that much, uh, certainly not from the rest of the nation at that point, uh, with one or two exceptions. Uh, and Carter ended up winning the caucuses, although I should say coming in second to no preference, but he came in ahead of all the live candidates. And uh, he won the presidency. So that's what made people notice the caucuses. So the system, in a sense, grew up like that. And the fact that uh, Teddy Kennedy challenged President Carter in the Iowa caucuses in 1980, and George H.W. Bush challenged Ronald Reagan in the Republican caucuses in 1980, that, in a sense, validated the caucuses as a legitimate part of the nomination process, and they've just taken off ever since then. But because of this confederal party structure, that means that the parties in Washington, the national committees and the, 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 
national chairs, they can hammer out certain rules and especially a calendar and say, okay, the state should go in this order on these dates. But they don't really have a lot of power to impose or enforce that, right? It's similar to, you know, the United Nations can assess a country a certain amount of dues the country may pay the dues or may not pay the dues. Well, it's the same way, in a sense, for the parties. And the parties are caught because they will threaten the states and say, if you don't hold the caucus, your, your primary or caucus event on the date in the order we assigned you, we will not seat any of your delegates or half your delegates, depending upon what threat they decide to impose. <coughs> the problem is, you're risking irritating people whose support you need in the general election the following November. So how seriously are you going to make good on those threats? So the parties are in a tough spot. Originally this time, the caucuses were supposed to be on February 6th. And then eight days later, New Hampshire. And then I think a couple days, a couple week or two later, uh, Nevada, then South Carolina, or the order to reverse, something like that. It's supposed to be only those four events in February. Florida didn't like that. They wanted to have a bigger voice. They moved up and caused all the leapfrogging that finally got resolved. But we have the caucuses in January. With all the hullabaloo, though, we have to remember that the caucuses don't elect delegates to the national convention. Right? They elect delegates to those county conventions, and they take decisions and make recommendations on platform issues for the state party platforms, but they don't directly elect delegates to the national convention, and it's delegates at the national convention that make you the presidential nominee. That doesn't come until the state parties meet to the conventions in June. So, Iowa, in a sense, is the center of the political universe until caucus night. And after that, we fall into a black hole. We fall off the face of the earth. I'll say reporters from out of state, you know, oh yeah, you love us all these weeks and up to today, and then tomorrow you'll throw us away like last night's cheap date. And of course, reporters will say, so what's your point? You know, pretty hard bitten through because I'm happy it's very nice. <coughs> John, I'm just getting to know, okay. Um, but there are no delegates chosen. Uh, what happens is simply we get a reading of the preferences of people in each party, if there's a contested caucus, for the relative preference among the contending candidates. Now, I was attractive for the candidates because I was a relatively accessible, even in winter, of course, in that year, most of the winter, they come and bought me at the state fair or various other events in the summer and fall. But it's a relatively inexpensive state where you can meet with small groups of people in a personal way. Iowans and New Hampshireites are spoiled. You know, the classic line is, you're going to vote for candidate so-and-so. Well, I don't know. I've only met her three or four times. I haven't met up my mind yet. <clears throat> but the advantage of the caucuses in that regard is that because Iowa is what we call a retail state in that sense, they meet candidates, meet uh, voters in small groups or individually, Candidates are forced to treat voters as real people. Well, how else would you do it? Well, in the big media states, voters are trotted out really and treated as campaign props rather than as real people. Uh, I had a TV crew from LA here in 2000 who talked to me about something, and a few days later they called and said, we come, we come ask you, we want to shoot some tape on something else. I said, okay. And they said, and I don't remember a name, so I'm going to say Farmer Brown. They said, you know, we were out where Vice President Gore was making an appearance. And you know, if the Vice President of the United States, especially a Democratic Vice President, were making an appearance in Los Angeles, some major celebrity or political figure would introduce the Vice President of the United States. But we went out there, and here's Farmer Brown introducing the Vice President of the United States. I said, welcome to Iowa. So in Iowa, the advantage is that candidates have to treat people as real people, and uh, voters as real people. The disadvantage, and what's always held against us, is that the caucuses make participation difficult. Because as opposed to a typical election where you have in Iowa maybe a 14-hour window where you can choose to decide to go when, you can decide when to go and cast your ballot at the polling place, maybe takes five minutes, depending upon when you go, but at a time convenient to you. You know, for the caucuses, it's at 6.30 or 7 o'clock on a winter night, you gotta hope there's not a blizzard, you gotta hope the babysitter shows up, you gotta be able to just sit there and spend a lot of time there. So it makes participation difficult, and I was criticized for that. And then especially I was criticized for the lack of representativeness. I was the fifth whitest state in the nation, if you think in terms of uh, 
people of European ancestry as opposed to people of non-European, Asian, uh, Native American, African, uh, Hispanic ancestry. I was the fifth whitest state in the nation. Uh, caucus goers are significantly older than the general population. So it's a, 2008 was somewhat of an exception because there are tremendous numbers of young people show up for Barack Obama. But people argue that, that I was just not very representative. Well, the, the, the where things will remain, I think, is that there's a, sim, there's a symbiotic relationship between candidates and the press. Candidates will think Iowa is important as long as the press does, and the press will think Iowa is important as long as the candidates do. Now, you do have some candidates skipping Iowa, and Kathy adverted to that. Uh, you know, John McCain essentially didn't play in Iowa last time around. Mitt Romney got burned badly in Iowa last time around by the uh, Republicans who were poll, even before losing the caucuses themselves. And he's essentially chosen to treat Iowa as a voluntary to go off. He his distance this time around. But generally speaking, Iowa is a pretty reasonable place for a small, relatively well-known, uh, un relatively unwell-known, uh, low-funded candidate try to make a splash and make the impression. And the reason you can do that, I'm sure we'll all talk about this, is that ultimately every candidate has precisely the same opponent. And that opponent's name is expected. The question is, on caucus night, did you do better than expected? Or did you do worse than expected? And if you overperformed expectations, you get tension, potentially increase in contributions, more serious consideration. And if you underperform expectations, all of a sudden is concerned that you may not be viable. That lets the air out of your tires and the, uh, uh, the donations tend to drop and, and the coverage and the support. I'll stop here. Mason 
City, Iowa. And have time we see that lots of times candidates are in three or four different places uh, a day and in three or four different places the next day. And I'm sure that, that, that lots of times it's up to their aides to tell them exactly where they are because they can really lose track. And the message is going to be the same wherever they go. So Dan Quayle is coming to North Iowa to speak at the Surf Ballroom in Clearwater, which is right next door to Mason City. But he flew into Mason City, to the Mason City Airport, to get there. There was a news conference. There was, there was a microphone like this and, and the news people at the Mason City Airport. He got off the plane and he told everybody there that he was so glad to be in, in uh, Clear Lake that day. And so somebody whispered to him, no, 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 no. And so, okay, he's not in Mason City, he's in Clear Lake. Then he went to the surf ballroom and got up on stage and said, I'm so glad to be in Mason City today. <laughs> and he was for poor Dean and Coyle. And uh, in 1996, when Bob Dole was uh, running for president, I, uh, I had to cover him for the newspaper. And he was going to speak at the Holiday Inn in uh, Mason City. So a friend of mine and I went out to the Holiday Inn. And the first thing we noticed as we pulled into the Holiday Inn parking lot, was that the parking lot was full, but all the cars' headlights were on, and everybody was still in their cars, and we're just trying to figure out what's, what's happening here. Is there some kind of national or what's going on? Well, what was going on at the University of Iowa was playing basketball. The game was in overtime, and everybody was in their cars waiting. And when the game was over, the headlights went off, and everybody went in. <laughs> Who was uh, fashionably late? Candidates are typically late. Anybody who covers politics, Kathy can go out to this. Uh, they hate to cover the candidate on his last stop of the day because he starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and he's going to shake hands with everybody in the room and it's going to be 15 or 20 minutes late out of there and then the next one and the next one. And if you got up at 5 o'clock at night, you're lucky if you get service at, at uh, 7. Anyway, on this particular night, Dole was late and he was in a, in a, uh, a conference room at the Holiday in a rectangular room and they had chairs set up all along the walls of the room, and Bill was going to come in, and he was going to stand in the center of the room, and then speak to everybody on, on all sides. And while uh, they were waiting for Bill to get there, they had a tape of big bad music for him. And they had the stars and stripes forever, and America the Beautiful. And so everybody was sitting around there just chit chat. And in the middle of this tape, there was a continuous running tape, in the middle of the tape was the national anthem. And it was so funny to watch because all these people were sitting talking to the national anthem, and they all stand up and they hands their hands and then they sit down and talk some more, and then the tape would go on the national anthem. It was a big drive. When uh, when Hillary Clinton uh, was uh, running uh, four years ago, uh, she came and uh, uh, made the parents actually she and Bill Clinton came and marched in a, in a parade in, in uh, clearly a 4th of July parade. It's a big deal up in North Iowa every year. It draws thousands of people. But that, that year, uh, Mitt Romney was also in that parade. But the big draw was the uh, former president, and Hillary Clinton, who walked the entire parade out, shaking hands with people and glad and doing what candidates do during parades. And Hillary Clinton uh, met with the Democratic supporters afterwards, and she was talking about her reaction to the parade. And she said, you know, everybody was waving at me, and they were using all their fingers. <laughs> uh, when when uh, Barack Obama uh, first announced uh, his, his candidacy, and he was the junior senator of Illinois uh, at the time, and I've covered enough of these things over the years, that when somebody comes and makes their first appearance uh, somewhere, if there's 40 or 50 people there, that's a pretty good crowd. And if there's less than that, then you have a name recognition problem. And if there's more than that, they're doing pretty well for getting that out of the shoe. And uh, Barack Obama came to the college in Mason City with 1,800 people the first night. And we thought, hey, this, there's something happening here. And his people had told me that if I wanted to have some one-on-one -on -one time with him, that if I was to at the, at the end of the speech, I was just supposed to go over to the door where, where there was an exit sign, and they would come and get me. And I thought, oh, good, you know, I'll have some one on one time. And then it occurred to me, how do I know when his speech is going to happen? So I just went over and stood for the entire, the entire time. And you know, when the speech was over, they came and got me, and they ushered me into a, a little room off the place where he was speaking. And he came in a few minutes later, he had his coat over his shoulder. He, he uh, put the coat down, I reached out to, to shake hands with him. And uh, the first thing he said to me is, he, he uh, said, uh, look, he said, before you say anything else, he said, I just have one.
one thing to tell you. And I said, what's that, Senator? He said, you are the only thing that's standing between me and dinner. I said, oh, tell me, I said, what is all that? <laughs> and while I was, while I was uh, there, they uh, brought him a, a big plate of lasagna for him. And, yeah. he, and he was eating there. And, and, uh, and I was thinking to myself, geez, I've been out here as long as he has. I went home to do that. <laughs> About six months later, he came uh, back to uh, Mason City. And it was the day after Christmas uh, in uh, 2000 and, uh, yeah, 2000, 2007. And, and uh, the caucuses were, were uh, January 3rd of the day. It was the, day of the next week. And I was curious to see if he had changed any uh, from the time that I had seen him before. Because now he was one of the front runners. And, and not just the junior senator from Illinois. He was on, on fire. And he spoke at a high school gym. And once again, I was told, hey, if we want to talk to him, we'll come and, and get you. And this time, they let me into it. I went through a door and, and was let into a, actually a practice gym at the high school. And they told me that I could have five minutes with it. The schedule was about five minutes. So I said, OK, what kind of questions are you going to ask? And uh, he came in this time. He, yeah, he had his coat over his shoulder. And he put it on the, on the gym floor. And somebody flipped him a basketball. And when I was eight, he stood under the basket. And then he went around the, the three-point line, starting at the side, and, and was shooting baskets. And I was watching for a moment. And I thought, my gosh, I've only got five minutes with him. <coughs> so I had my little reporter's notebook with me. And, and he would shoot. And I would stand right next to him and answer questions. And then he would jump over and take another shot. And I would jump over with my notebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I got my interview. <laughs> and it was about that time that I, that I was thinking, that this is one of the messages I'm going to leave with you tonight. That's the kind of thing that really only happened in, in Iowa. Maybe, maybe New Hampshire. But Iowa, where you had that, that hands-on uh, kind of relationship with the community. And every, every one of you in this room has the opportunity to meet the President of the United States. Think about that. Everyone in this room has the opportunity to meet the President of the United States. Only thing is you don't know who it's going to be at the time. But if you go to all these, these, these functions, they make themselves available. And, well, I have a lot more I want to tell you, but I think we'll get into the, uh, the panel the discussion about this. I want to leave you with this. I had occasion to talk to Vice President uh, Mondale, or former Vice President Mondale, about the Iowa caucuses. That's another thing. A little guy like me in the city of Iowa be able to call up in Minnesota and talk to a former Vice President of the United States about the caucuses. But Mondale was in the caucuses in 76 with Jimmy Carter, and then in 80 when Carter ran again, and then in 84 when, when Mondale ran. Here's what Mondale said about the Iowa caucuses. He says, you know, after Iowa with its face-to-face -face campaign style, you kind of go from one television station to another. It's not that way in Iowa. It's open. It's real. In Iowa, they want to be asked. They don't want to be assumed. And it's possible to go from the Duke to the White House. Jimmy Carter did it. Barack Obama did it. Oh, there are weaknesses in the Iowa caucuses. If you're a soldier serving overseas with a mother of three caring for your children at home, or if you're at work in the evening, you can't go to the caucuses. But there's a strength to them, too. They are meetings. People are there together. It's a debate. It's tangible. It's real. And it's not manipulative. In Iowa, by the time you get to the caucuses, people really know the candidates. It's a hallmark. American politics. Thank you for your time. I'll start by asking a question and then a uh, question or two, and then hopefully you all will ask questions because I'll be more interested in my question. Uh, I want to pick up on what uh, all of you talked about, and that has to do with the truncated. Uh, schedule we have. The caucuses are two months from tonight, right? And this is the second go round in which you had a reasonable schedule and now you have this very truncated schedule. And so the question I have is sort of a two part question. The first one is what is the need, what is the impact of stuff of truncating the schedule so much on the cam on the campaigns in general, which which campaigns are advantaged by, which are disadvantaged by and the second one then is, are we always going to have it happen this way? That is, are we always going to end up having schedules and then somebody jumps and have to scrunch it together? So. All right, well, um, I'll try with the, I'll try to handle the first part, which, um, which is uh, what the impact will be. Uh, typically, 
Strictly speaking, when you compress the calendar, it makes the early states even more important. Um, because a candidate who wins the Iowa caucuses, instead of having two weeks for, for perhaps to either do damage control or um, to really take advantage of a good showing in Iowa before you get to uh, New Hampshire now, has uh, what, less than a week, um, less than a week to, to get from Iowa to New Hampshire. And, and the calendar goes you know, just that fast down through um, South Carolina, um, Nevada, or Florida, Nevada. And, and so you don't really have very much time in between. And that means that uh, any, any candidate who does well in both Iowa and New Hampshire, for example, um, if Ben Romney, for example, were to win Iowa and New Hampshire, I think it's very hard to stop him then on the way to the nomination. It's very hard for another candidate to even come in in South Carolina, for example, and, and do well there and, and stop a candidate's momentum. Uh, there have been some studies on the impact of early states. Um, there was one in particular at Brown University that, that got a lot of press this year that said that um, the voters in early states, uh, their vote is worth five of <coughs> one to one vote of, of people who, whose nominating process comes later. Now, I don't know if five to one is, is the correct proportion. Um, and, and part of that, that argument is made, you know, to, to say that Iowa and New Hampshire are not representative enough to have that kind of clout. Um, but, but it is, you know, a bunch, it's one of the reasons why the Republican National Committee did not want the, the calendar to be as compressed as it was four years ago. They tried to separate it out. Um, and, and just to, for the second part of the question, I'll just say that uh, it remains to be seen whether we're always going to have this or not. Um, we'll, we don't know yet how far the Republican National Committee is going to go to actually enforce its rules. Um, they said they'll take away half the delegates, et cetera. Well, uh, Florida is the big offender here, and they are the host of the National Convention. Are you going to really lock out uh, all, the, all the members of the National Convention, uh, all the delegates of the host city? Um, you know, I, I find it really hard to believe that they're really going to do that, and I think Florida believes the same thing. And furthermore, they don't care. They say that being up front, uh, the importance of being up front is worth more to them than having all of their delegates at the back end. So um, I'll just I'll see what you guys think. But... Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. No, Kathy's precisely right. I mean, all these states want to lessen the impact of Iowa. And as they press the schedule, they increase the impact of Iowa. If you really want to be sane about this, and I've always maintained no rational person would ever design this nominating system that we have, but it just blew up in between the cracks, you would lengthen out the nomination process, which would give people more time to show hidden strengths, to show hidden weaknesses, and so forth. It's not supposed to be a sprint, it's supposed to be a marathon of sorts. But the more we compress it, you know, you give, I, I don't know if the Iowa's three million people, I don't know how big the state of New Hampshire is, probably not much more than three million, that much. But even if you look to, it's less, it's less yeah. It's so, I mean, the two states together, the total population is less than the, the population of the city of Los Angeles. And if you look at the actual numbers of people who actually participate, you're talking together, maybe between the two states, the population of Memphis, Tennessee, something like that. So, you know, 600,000 maybe, something like that. So that's the question, why should they have that impact? But again, that's the way this works. By compressing the schedule, you not only get the chance to ride immediate strengths without revealing weaknesses, or be unable to recover from a stumble, because you don't have time, but you advantage the better organized and better funded candidates. You don't give the uh, lesser candidates, uh, lesser well, not as well known, not as well funded, a chance to grow into it after they demonstrate, perhaps in one of the two first events, some unexpected uh, attraction. Well, that's what I was going to touch on, is, is the, the, the money aspect of it. Because un unfortunately, when we talk about politics, we have to, we have to talk about money. And if with a compressed schedule, where candidates don't have time to, if, if you lose in, in Iowa, you don't have time really to, to recover uh, and raise a lot of money to, to go to places beyond beyond New Hampshire. It used to be when, when uh, George McGovern won the nomination in 1972, uh, he, he uh, won it by winning the, the uh, California primary in, in June. And uh, many of us can, can remember in 1968, uh, the Democratic nomination was still up for grabs when Robert Kennedy 
Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles after winning the California primary in June. Now we have things like Super Tuesday, where there's 28 primaries on the, on the same day, uh, very, very early on. And candidates have, have to have, have time to raise a, raise a lot of money for, the, for that sort of thing. And you simply have to, to win or exceed expectations. I was, I was kind of surprised, actually, this year when money dropped out after the, after the straw poll. Because the, you know, the straw poll is, is supposedly meaningless, uh, it, it, except, that, except that it isn't, because of the expectation factor. And I thought it was you know, amazing that Plenty had finished third, and it killed his campaign, and then Kane finished fourth, and it launched his campaign because of expectations. But at any rate, the, the compressed schedule uh, doesn't give candidates uh, time to raise the kind of money that they need to raise now uh, to win the nomination. I just want to add, um, one thing I always say about Iowa not being representative of the country, um, yes, demographically we are not representative of the country, uh, but when you look at the issues that Iowans are talking to presidential candidates about, the questions that they're asking them, uh, you, Look at polls at the question at the issues that I want to say are most important to them. It tracks pretty well with what voters around the country are saying, um, and for voters of their party are saying around the country. So, if for Iowa Republicans, it's jobs and the economy, bar none. I mean, those are the top issues. Um, yes, they're interested in social issues as well, um, but it really, as the top priority, jobs and the economy. Are the biggest issues in Iowa, and that is exactly what voters <coughs> nationally are saying. Furthermore, Iowans um, are—they are very diligent about taking their responsibilities seriously. You hear this all the time from the national media, and you hear it from candidates. Um, Iowans are a lot better informed. They take a lot more—they um, they ask better questions. They do a good job of, of educating candidates. They, where the candidates aren't just here to educate us. We're educating the candidates. We make them better candidates by the end of the process. And even if even if all of that were not true, uh, it doesn't matter because Iowa and New Hampshire insist on being first. And we will be first whether anybody thinks that we deserve it or not. Um, you know, not only does Iowa and New Hampshire, we insist on being first, but um, you know, in order for the rest of the country to say, no, you can't be first, they have to agree on another system. Uh, and they can't agree. They have never been able to agree on some other system to take the place of what we have now. And so Iowa and New Hampshire have continued to benefit from the status quo. And I would suspect that we'll do that for some time to come. I would take issue with one point, though. Um, when we were doing the new edition of the caucus book and for the 2008 chapter, I took a particular look at issue positions and issue concerns. Yeah, demographically, Iowa is not like the rest of the country. But in terms of issues, by and large, Iowa Democrats did track what Democrats were concerned about nationally. And Iowa Republicans did the same with Republicans, with one exception. Iowa Republicans were a lot more concerned about abortion than Republicans around the rest of the country were. And I would probably bet that this time around it would be same-sex marriage. Uh, so there is that skewing factor, which in fact could lead other uh, Republicans around the country if a strong social issues person who wins the caucuses to discount the results of the Iowa caucus at some point by saying, well, that's just those Iowa Republicans who are particularly concerned about social issues. Well, you know, social issues uh, social issues are important um, in to, to Iowa Republicans, but in the, in the list of priorities, um, they it factors very low. Um, you know, if you give a list of, of 10 issues, mm -hmm. um, abortion is, is closer to the bottom. Now, is it is it one of those deal breaker issues? Now, that's another question, and I, and I think you're right in that sense that uh, you know once you check that box, we don't have to talk to them about it again. But um, it, it may be that if they give the wrong answer to that one box, then they don't get to get they don't get your attention to talk about jobs and the economy. Other questions? Good. Um, being that the schedule is so condensed and and that things are going to happen a lot quicker, like you guys mentioned, uh, less than a week when uh, the candidates or when the conference is going to New Hampshire. Uh, do you th what do you think the, the advice to the candidates should be as far as uh, promoting their, you know, and mobilizing in New Hampshire with Iowa and steering other states as well? Because you think that, like, like you mentioned, if you can take Iowa and New Hampshire, then you're, you're, you're looking pretty good going down the road. But if you don't do well in 
New Hampshire Republicans are very different from Iowa Republicans. New Hampshire Republicans are much more secular, less evangelical, less religiously conservative. They're more libertarian on both social issues and economic issues, saying, you know, live free or die, no taxes, and so forth. Uh, it's hard to see. I mean, you can live off the land, so to speak, for a certain amount of time. But it's hard to see how Michelle Bachman or Rick Santoro live to fight in New Hampshire if they don't get out of Iowa and do it real well. So I think, and you've seen Michelle Bachman double down. She'll talk about staff in New Hampshire. I don't, I don't know if that's serious. I mean, it's Iowa's a Hail Mary pass, and if that doesn't work, you're done. Uh, I don't know if you guys, I think, again, Perry's got money to go beyond Iowa. Romney, again, has flirted with Iowa, but not done much, but he's got money. Ron Paul has money. Uh, that's another issue, of course, the Ron Paul factor. But um, Kane, who knows what's going to happen with, with the Hermitator right now. So <laughs> we're not sure where that's going to fall at this particular point. But um, again, for the lesser candidates, um, uh, Santorum and Bachman, um, they've got to do well in Iowa. It almost, you know, don't, you know, it's like game six for the Cardinals. Don't worry about game seven, because if you don't get through game six, there's no game seven. And they're winning. Well, we, we uh, talked about how if you win Iowa and New Hampshire, you're in pretty good shape, and, and, and you certainly are. The other fact of the matter is that, that for most of the candidates, they have to win one, one or the other. And I think, uh, for example, with, with uh, Romney, uh, he seems to be pretty, in pretty good shape in, in New Hampshire, so that he, he can just hold his own like, like he's been doing in Iowa, and uh, at least not fall uh, where he doesn't meet expectations. And that old expectations thing, I think it'll be all right. But with Michelle Bachman, almost has to win Iowa because she probably won't, won't do well uh, in New Hampshire. So winning both is, is, is great for the candidates, obviously. Losing both, you're, you're probably out. So you have to win one or the other for sure. I, I would just add um, the, the equation is the math is interesting for Rick Perry. Um, he was expected to come in and be uh, basically the guy who consolidated the conservatives in Iowa. And, and then, um, you know, while Mitt Romney was going to be the strong candidate in New Hampshire, um, Perry then goes on to pick up South Carolina, which, uh, you know, uh, people in South Carolina kind of talk like he, he does. And, and, and actually, uh, I was just talking to a reporter from there who said that that does appeal to people in South Carolina. Uh, they, Rick Perry is going to be stronger there than he probably is in either Iowa or New Hampshire. His problem is that I don't think um, he. I think he's on a continuing on a downward trend in Iowa. And if he does very poorly here, um, then that will probably affect his either affect his chances in South Carolina or make South Carolina not matter so much. The other question. Person who isn't 
watching 15 minutes later, <laughs> or half an hour later. And how about the novel concept of taking your time and getting it right the first time? I, I would just say that um, the the 24 hour news cycle has greatly blown up the emphasis on polling. Um, for the, there's a there's a ton of polls out there. Not all of them are worth the paper that they're printed on. And um, every one of them seems to be reported as if they are gospel truth, and that they, that in fact um, they're, that they're somehow predictive of, of how the election is going to come out at this stage. Uh, right after the straw poll, um, Rick Perry gets into the race, and, and all of the the whole rhetoric then becomes it's a two man race, Mitt Romney, Rick Perry. Well, you know, apparently Herman Cain didn't get the memo. <laughs> uh, you have. Uh, really a lot of emphasis on the horse race, and, and I'm not one who is a, um, I, I'm not going to bash horse race journalism because I, I think that one of the things people want to know about the candidates is, you know, who's ahead. Um, but before there's any sort of vote taken, um, who's ahead is only um, a very small part of the story, and I, you know, I think a lot of the rest of that gets lost when you're, when you're constantly churning the, the next deadline is two minutes away. I'll, let me say something in favor of print, and it's not because they each gave me a check. Um, broadcast journalism is a very different medium from print journalism. And to give you an example, uh, the day of 9-11, I was teaching a class at Drake that morning, and of course, we went in, it was an early class, and we went to the language lab to watch television coverage of the Trade Center and the towers. And uh, I said to my students, I said, watch all the TV you can today, but please tomorrow read several newspapers. And the reason is that there are different functions for print and broadcast, and this comes up in politics as well. This will sound really cold, but I mean, in an analytical sense, I think it's valid. Watching those airliners hit the trade towers was great television, right? Sort of hypnotically horrifying. But television specializes in covering people, events, immediacy, emotion. That's television's strength. Even if you get a dumb reporter saying, how did you feel? You know, that sort of thing. But it covers immediacy, emotion, people, and events really well. Television does a crummy job covering issues, ideas, institutions, processes. That's what newspapers can do well. Now, newspapers can be demagogic and incendiary as well. Remember those classic pictures of the Hearst publications, remember the Maine from the War of 1898 and so forth. But still, newspapers can cover institutions and issues and processes and ideas a lot better. But we get most of our news from television. Those of you who are college students, you overwhelmingly get what news you get from TV or from social media and websites and things like that. And of course, there's still supposedly some vetting of television, even cable stations, for what's legit and what's not. You know, if you go out to the web, the web's great. There's a lot of garbage out there. And you've got to be able to tell what's legitimate from what's not. But this 24-7 cycle, you know, the goal is get it first and get it right, but those are sometimes in tension with each other. And as you said, if they make a mistake, it's out there forever, and it, it doesn't get corrected. I, I would just add, I, you know, I think that the, the role of mainstream media has had to change in, in response to not only the 24-hour news cycle, but especially the rise of uh, internet news and social media. Uh, we don't get to be the gatekeepers anymore. <coughs> and by that, I mean that uh, I used to be, you know, be able to get a press release from a candidate, um, look at it, and say, this is crap, throw it in the round file, and no one would ever see it again. <laughs> that, you know, now, even before I open the, the press release on my email, it's probably all over the internet. Um, I don't get to decide whether you get to see this thing or not. Uh, so then it becomes my responsibility to tell you, oh, by the way, that press release that's all over the internet, it's crap. Here's why. <laughs> you know, and, and so my role becomes more of a fact checker, more of a context builder, you know, more of a, you know, here's
here's here's what the candidates are not telling you, um, and and you know I think that that is why you see, for example, uh, websites like PolitiFact <coughs> winning Pulitzer prizes, um, that they they are really taking that role and and building a whole brand around just the fact check. Uh, one of the things that that, that occurs to me is central in terms of the success of candidates in the Iowa caucuses is the quality of their staff. The number of candidates have sort of uh, lucked into or benefited from the, the assistance of uh, very you know, skillful workers here in, in Iowa. And I'm just curious what your analysis of the staffs of the Republican candidates would be. Is there anyone who is a little under the radar now that has a really strong staff that might benefit them going forward the next few months? Well, I'll, I'll say that you know, even though Mitt Romney's not here, uh, he has a heck of a good campaign organization. Um, it's probably the I would I would say bigger and more active than just about anybody else's campaign organization at this point. Um, they are um, quietly working under the radar while the candidate's not here um, to try to make sure that he can beat expectations. Um, so I mean, I think that's one example of, of somebody who uh, had. First of all, Mitt Romney had the benefit of having run before, and so he had a lot of people who were with him before who were back again and, and know the candidate and know the, the they know the, the people who were supporting him before, and they have an opportunity to capitalize on that. Um, I think Rick Perry came in and built up a good staff pretty fast, um, and they got off the ground pretty fast. He needed to be able to do that because he came in late. Um, I don't know that they've been able to sustain that necessarily. Um, but I'll also say Ron Paul has a pretty good organization. Uh, five years ago, he came in late, or four years ago, he came in late. Um, he <coughs> did not build quite as much of a ground game as he has this time. Uh, he's definitely in a, in a position to better his results uh, this time around. Well, I was just going to say that, that uh, Four years ago, uh, when when uh, Barack Obama won the won the Iowa caucuses, uh, one of the things that that uh, the reason the reason that he won was because his, his one of the reasons he won was because his, his staff was good enough to to educate people that they had to get there on on caucus night, and they did. They they came out in, in huge numbers, and four years before that. Um, Howard Dean's people were all over the state. They practically lived here. We've had some candidates live here. Richard Gephardt lived here for a while. Chris Dodd, I think, moved his family here four years ago. And that's all very well and good, but if you don't get to, to uh, the caucuses between 7 and 8.30 on a cold Monday or Tuesday night, uh, it doesn't do any good. And it strikes me that, that uh, one of uh, part of President Obama's background uh, is that he was a neighborhood organizer. He knew how to organize. And he had staffs that, that, uh, that knew how to organize. Now, for us in the, in the media, one of the things that we appreciate about staffs is if, if your candidate's coming to town and you give them more than 24 hours' notice, that's, that's a good staff. So we can plan. Uh, you know, staff can't save a bad candidate, but bad staff can really do big harm to, to an otherwise good candidate. Um, th little things like um, you know, making sure that there's just a Few too few chairs for the number of people in the room, so that you have to set up more. You know, and it makes it seem like there's going to be a big crowd. Um, you know, things like, uh, for example, Michelle Bachman had problems with. Uh, you know, she has a little problem with with stating the facts. Um, you know, things, things, things that that prep, you know, good prep work on. You know, where John Wayne was actually found. You know, those kinds of things can uh, you know really be damaging if you don't get it right. Um, and you know. The thing I'll say about Barack Obama is that his genius was not that he had big numbers of, of you know, really crack paid staff in Iowa. Um, he actually broke the mold a little bit by, by going with a lot more volunteer staff and then giving them a lot more authority than volunteers usually have to actually organize and do some things on their own. Um, you know, the reason that Barack Obama had as many people in the caucuses as he did was not because he had necessarily pe you know, paid people doing robocalls every night. He, they, he had people calling all of their friends and relatives and saying, oh, won't you please come, you 
you know, to the caucuses, and, and that was very, very effective four years ago. I would just add, not with regard to staff, but remember with regard to what Kathy was mentioning, for all the whole bull about the caucuses, you know, if you get more than 20% of eligible people in the party turning out to the caucus, that's a lot of people. And so this huge impact from a small state anyway, from usually less than 20% or less than a quarter of the members of the party who could turn out for this event. Now, the Democrats had about 240,000 last time, which might have been maybe 40% of the registered Democrats, although that included a significant chunk of independents who we registered to participate in the Democratic Party.